Oh, hello, friends. Thank you for coming to visit Lucy and me. It's good to see you. I love a good conversation. I love words. Always have. <laughs> As a boy, I used to read at night by the firelight until my father would holler at me. William, douse that candle! Or you'll be no good to me in the morning! I'd just wait until he was asleep, and then light my candles or pine plugs again and read into the night. As I grew older, I suppose I began to use words, sometimes as weapons. I fancied that the use of sophisticated words distinguished one man from another. Oh, I was a loquacious young man. How about that horse you had shot yeah. the other day? Huh? Where are you from, young man? Lowhampton, New York. But then I married my wife and we relocated here to Pulteney. Miller, right? That's correct. Wasn't your grandfather a preacher? Yes, my uncle too, Baptist. After Lucy and I married, I turned my back on my family and the faith I was raised in. They were part of the less cultivated crowd of Lowhampton, I might say. We moved to Pulteney, Vermont and lived in the city. I became a deist, considered myself a man of reason. I rejected the Bible as the word of God and no more placed myself under its authority than under the authority of the moon. You should see my uncle, the Reverend Elihu Miller. I was so smug in my opinions, I took to mocking my uncle and grandfather behind their backs. Ye believe it, and were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed. A milk can is sealed. Not a man, if you ask me. <laughs> I'm sure I grieved my mother bitterly. But then I joined the army. I loved my country and the British were infringing on American sovereignty on many fronts. We were called on to fight the Second War of Independence. I was made a captain. I always wanted to live up to my forefather's reputation. Brave heroes of the revolution were they. I learned I was no coward. I could fight. I saw much death. Death on the battlefield, death in the camps, from the typhus that ravaged the troops. In the face of so much death, I sought truth desperately. The deist taught that death was the final extinguishing of the candle of human life but I can no longer accept the comfortless finality of that belief. It explained nothing about eternity and offered me nothing in my hour of need. The religion of my youth, on the other hand, posited some assurance of eternal life, even if salvation's attaining was clouded in some mystery. So, I decided to go home. For years, I had rejected the God of revealed religion. But where had that left me? I was ready to build a new foundation upon which I could live a useful and virtuous life. So I went back to farming and went back to my family. Ready? 
I even went back to church. Such a pleasure to see you here today. Good to see you as well. This time I was open, where before I had been sarcastic. And all I can tell you is, God blessed me with his amazing grace. He wasn't distant or neutral like my deist theology taught. He was right there, personal, even loving. I needed his forgiveness. I desired his closeness. And the simple things like farming, family, and church begin to hold deep satisfaction for me. Oh, and I started studying the Bible. I told you, I love words. And I found the words of the prophecies of the Old Testament to be fascinating and inspired. I pondered the words of Daniel and marveled at the specificity of the prophecies he made, especially relating to the coming Messiah. His words had proven to be accurate to the very year when Christ was baptized and the very year of the crucifixion. When I learned what Daniel had to say about the end times, about, as he called it, the cleansing of the sanctuary, I realized that a warning bell was called for. This world was not destined to last forever. God would return in triumph and in judgment. In Daniel, I found a timely and urgent warning. Christ was coming, and soon, we needed to get ready. The more I read, the more I studied, the more I began to be led by God, even in my dreams. I was convicted that the glorious day of Jesus' return was close at hand. The day was near when the prophecies would be fulfilled. The dead in Christ would rise, and those children of God who were yet alive would be changed, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. I wanted the world to know that the judge and bridegroom was coming. Though I was no preacher, I was just a farmer, I grudgingly promised God that I would go and speak of these things if anyone should ever ask me. And then, in 1831, <laughs> someone did. Irving. Hey, Uncle. It's good to see you. What brings you by? I'm sent by the congregation of Dresden. They've asked me to have you come speak. About what? About the end of the world. Why don't you come inside? Numbers 14 and Ezekiel 4 both reveal both reveal how God appointed each day for a year as the 70 weeks to the Messiah were fulfilled in 490 years. These prophetical days extend to the coming Advent as well. And I see the 2,300 days as referenced in Daniel related to a time from the end of the Persian conquest through the end of the fourth kingdom. And this end I see coming in the year 1843. I don't know why the Lord chose to bless those messages, but he surely did. One invitation turned to two, two turned to four. Before long, I was being invited to preach in churches all throughout the Eastern seaboard. I found in going through the Bible, the end of all things was clearly and emphatically predicted, both as to time and manner. Daniel identifies the starting point of the prophecy. He predicts the very year of Jesus' baptism, the very year of his crucifixion, hundreds of years before they happened. Soon I was traveling all the time, often in winter,
long, cold, lonely trips. The message the Lord had given me urged me forward, but the labor was difficult. I was often sick, and I dearly missed my wife, Lucy. I wrote to her often, my tone as if we were having an actual conversation. But her responses, which were few in any case, often took weeks to reach me. But what choice did I have? The day of the Lord was coming soon, and this work could not wait. It was my heart's desire that all sinners, including myself, be prepared to meet the Lord before it was too late. When the spring equinox of 1843 passed without his return, I was considerably discouraged. But others of the brethren began to re-examine the revealed time. 1844 was determined, and according to Samuel S. Snow, the tenth day of the seventh month of the Jewish year was the day determined. That day, the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the culmination of the Feast of Trumpets, I was convinced our Lord would return on October 22, 1844. The expected day finally came, and we prepared to meet the Lord. But as you know, our expectations were not fulfilled. We had done all we could. I will not deny that the disappointment was bitter. It was as if all of the demons from the bottomless pit were let loose upon us. We were mocked. I was mocked. Hey, Miller, you got the time? <laughs> <laughs> It's a good thing the Lord had already humbled me once in my life, for I was truly humbled again. I leaned back into the Word for answers. For a time, I was convinced that the door to salvation had been closed and that it was too late for repentance and forgiveness. But I don't think that anymore. Too many folks have been coming to the Lord in these recent days, days after the great disappointment. I see the gates of heaven are still open to those who humble themselves before the Lord and welcome Him into their hearts. Thank the Lord it is not yet too late. I still love words, but I offer them more quietly now. I still believe that the return of Jesus is truly imminent and that the prophets of old and the prophets of today are right to call the people to repentance. I'm a sinner. All men are, save Jesus. All men have made mistakes, but the Lord knows our hearts, and He is gracious to forgive our sins through the saving work of His Son. I wish you well, my brothers and my sisters, and don't be lazy. Keep yourselves prepared, for the Lord is coming soon. Be ready, for it is not yet too late.